Okay, my clock is ticking, so that means the session is, uh, has officially started. Um, hello and welcome. This is Dev 308, JavaScript, the developer experience. Um, first of all, congratulations. Give yourself a pat on the back. You've survived TechEd. This is the last session of the conference. Thanks for sticking around so long. I was fully prepared to be speaking to uh, empty chairs, but this is a nicely filled up room. Thank you. Um, how many of you attended my session yesterday about JavaScript, the language? Okay, about half of you. Um, I apologize, my introduction is going to be uh, redundant for you, but for the rest of you guys who don't know me yet, uh, my name is Andrew Miadovic. I'm a program manager um, at Microsoft. I work in the developer division and in the browser programmability and tools team. What that team does is build the Chakra JavaScript engine, uh, that is the engine in IE9 and IE10, um, as well as we build the tools um, for JavaScript development in the browser and in Visual Studio. And the focus of this talk is the tools in Visual Studio and specifically what is new in those tools in Visual Studio 2012. So let's just dive right in. Uh, the main objective for me is to, uh, for you to take away the details of what is new in Visual Studio 2012 for JavaScript. So um, what is the new editing experience? How much has the editor been enriched? How can I take advantage of it? as well as um, what are the new tools for debugging JavaScript applications uh, and how can they help me solve the, the common problems that, uh, that you might encounter during debugging JavaScript applications. And actually, I do have one more question for you. How many of you guys um, do a lot of JavaScript development on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis? Maybe about, a, okay, about half, that's cool. Um, and the rest of you, are you just curious about JavaScript mostly? Okay, excellent, cool. Um, so some of you may be familiar with some of the, the techniques that I'll be showing. Um, if you've used Visual Studio 2010, some of the tools were available there, but we made them much better. Um, and this is mostly what, I, what we'll be talking about. So if you did use Visual Studio 2010, well, didn't it have some tooling for JavaScript? It did, but they were limited. They were limited in a couple of ways, primarily because they were targeting only uh, Microsoft Ajax uh, JavaScript patterns and really weren't up to snuff when it came to other third-party libraries and different patterns that are being used. And also, when you compared the tooling that you have available in C-sharp on VB uh, to what was available in JavaScript, they really just weren't on the same level. So with Visual Studio 2012, we've elevated JavaScript to a first-class status among other languages in Visual Studio. And I'll um, hopefully show you exactly how. So first, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the editor. And by the way, I'll have only a handful of slides most of the time we'll spend in Visual Studio itself with a bunch of demos. Um, the, the underpinning of the new editor is the same Chakra JavaScript engine that runs in a browser. And that gave us a big advantage in that a Chakra can run JavaScript code very fast. So it can actually execute your code even as you type it to give you more accurate information and IntelliSense and other circumstances like that. We've added some of the features that, you're, that you probably are familiar with if you program in C-sharp or VB, such as code folding, intelligent, intelligent uh, or smart indentation, brace matching, and go to definition. Those were absent in Visual Studio 2010, and they're very much sort of the bread and butter of, of modern development in, in Visual Studio. And they turned out to be much harder to do in JavaScript than in other languages. Um, I'll explain a little bit uh, why that is. And then we have rewritten IntelliSense completely from scratch for JavaScript, such that it is now based on execution, and it can accommodate a variety of patterns that are prevalent in JavaScript libraries of today. A little more about IntelliSense. Uh, its accuracy comes from the fact that we can run your code. JavaScript is a dynamic language. Unlike in C Sharp or in C++, there really isn't much that the IntelliSense can go on statically. There are no class definitions. There isn't any metadata that we can just grovel on the side. Everything in JavaScript is constructed dynamically at runtime. So we have to execute your code, at least portions of it, to be able to provide any reasonable intelligence. So that allows us to run your code as well as third-party code, and everything just kind of works. Um, we've expanded our support for documentation styles. Um, that gives you richer tooltips, regardless of what style of documentation a given library might use. And then finally, um, there is extensibility. So we do a lot of things out of the box, and you will see that we handle a vast majority of scenarios just fine out of the box. 
But there might be certain situations where you know, a library might have some semantics, such as a certain level or a certain style of object-oriented programming that we cannot deduce just from the code of the library. And if you really need to, you can extend our IntelliSense. There's actually a very nice and simple um, extensibility story um, that you can plug into to get your own flavor of IntelliSense if you, if you are so inclined. So much for the slides. Let's dive into Visual Studio and uh, see some of this in action. I'll spend most of my time on this chair, and it's kind of wobbly, so hopefully uh, you won't see me falling over. OK. Um, let's switch to Visual Studio. So what you see here, that's uh, just a vanilla template from uh, Windows 8 Metro applications. Um, I've tweaked it a little bit to uh, emphasize some of the things that we're doing. But that's just the default JavaScript file that you get um, with that template. And what kind of stands out right from the get-go is a few of the familiar features from other languages. So you can see the outlining here on the left. And let me just double check. Everybody in the back, can you see that code, or do I have to zoom in? Yes? Yes? OK, great. Thank you. Um, so do you see the familiar outlining, plus and minus, which you can fold the code uh, at any level? Great. Familiar. You probably take it for granted, but it wasn't there in, in Visual Studio 2010 for JavaScript. Um, next thing is brace matches, matching. So here we have an event handler that is kind of long, and I might want to know where the uh, matching closing uh, parenthesis is, and that's right there at the bottom. And if I hit Control and Brace, I will be taken right there at the bottom. You can see my cursor moved. Um, if I did Control Shift, Brace, I'm going to select this entire block of text. Again, something that you probably are familiar with from other languages, but now we're bringing JavaScript to the same level. Okay. Um, smart indentation. Also new for JavaScript, um, if you're not familiar with the terminology, the point of smart indentation is it, it uses the context of your code and the, the established conventions and settings that you might have to indent the code correctly if you hit enter. In this case, a you know, common convention is to indent one below uh, for the if statements, so that's where the cursor goes. Before, in 2010, we were actually using block indentation, so we would um, align it uh, right, right there with the previous line, which I can't seem to do right now. Anyway, it would go right about here. Here, maybe. Anyway, <laughs> it would go here. And that's block indentation basically lining up the caret with the previous line. So we're doing much better now because for the most part, the block indentation is not what you wanted. And in fact, we don't specialize it for any set of patterns. It's actually very broadly applicable. So if I say, if I were to introduce a variable initialization list and hit an enter right here, you'll notice we're also lining up correctly where you would want us to be. So again, just a nice little feature that you get for free. It took a lot of work to make it happen, because JavaScript is a little more complicated. Um, great. So let's uh, undo all these changes. Um, and the last on that list is go to definition. Um, that's a big one if you're just approaching a new code base and you're not familiar with it, and you want to learn what a given function does. Um, here, this is based on the WinJS library. And one of the core functions there is the process all, which kind of grovels through all of your controls and does a bunch of magic behind the scenes. So if I wanted to see what it actually does, I can right click or hit F12 and do go to definition. That takes me to the base.js file that's part of the WinJS library. And here I can kind of examine what's going on in that function. So again, thank you. Uh, I really missed that feature as well in the, in the previous release. So now we have it. So in many ways, we are really on par now with other languages. And yeah, the go to definition thing is really a hard thing to do if you think about JavaScript being purely dynamic. At, just by looking at the code, there's no way to know where this function is really going to take you. So execution-based um, editor capabilities are key here. So let me close this. OK, so that's just the basics. Now, what I really want to show you is some of the muscle behind the IntelliSense engine in the new editor. So I'll uh, remove all the content. And we'll start with something really basic, right? So I'll create an object. And I'll use the, uh, uh, the object literal notation. We'll give it a property 1. And we'll give it a, one, a value of 1 as well. Now, if I come over here and hit O dot, actually, just hit, let's just hit O. Um, now, you'll see that my, the, the list of properties includes my newly added 1, as well as some of the functions that I inherited from object dot prototype. Great, that's fairly simple. Um, one other thing to point out is that the, if I then type in one and dot, 
we recognize that uh, property one has a value that is a number. So what you get, get is a, a number-specific IntelliSense. So you get like two fixed or two precision and so forth. If I go back and change that one to be, let's say, a string, foo, and do the same thing, you'll notice that the, li the list has actually changed. We recognize that it's a string this time, and we give you a car at and length and other things like that. So we were able to, by, by running your code, we were able to determine what uh, type this value is going to have at runtime. Um, let's try something else. Let me try just adding one more property. That's rather loud. OK. Looks like the conference is winding down and uh, things are getting folded up. Let me continue anyway. Um, so JavaScript allows you to write properties directly without declaring anything up front. So here I'm going to just add a new property to. And let's give it a value of an array, for instance. OK, so now if I do O dot, I see property 1 and I see property 2. So regardless of how you edit it, it's there. And if I do 2 dot, then you'll see I get array-specific IntelliSense. Among other things, I see for each and so forth, right? So again, we're able to recognize, regardless of um, how you edit your properties, what types they might have. And just to uh, round it out, another interesting mechanism in JavaScript is you can use the index notation um, to add more properties because objects are just property bags. So if I do this and give it another string, uh, let's stick with foo. Now, the property 3 is there, as you would expect. And if I dot into it, you can see that it has, that is a string. It is recognized. Um, actually, can I ask you guys to hold off on questions? I'll try to leave some time at the end. Um, I have a ton of demos, and I'm afraid I'm not going to get through all of them um, otherwise. But I'll, I'll leave some time for questions at the end for sure. Great. So we can handle a number of different things. Um, if you're familiar with ECMAScript 5, there is yet another way of defining properties, which is the object.definePropity uh, method. I talked about it yesterday. And it allows me to attach a property to an arbitrary object. Let's give it a property 4. And this time, I'll give it a descriptor. Um, again, refer to my previous session if you'd like to know the details. And this time, I'm going to inject a function in here. So let's take a function that takes one argument A and returns 5 always, regardless of what you pass it. And now, I'm back to, to my object, dot. 4 is there. And in fact, we recognize that it's a function. If you, if you see, there's a little different icon next to it. And if I open a parenthesis, I, we recognize that it's a function that has an argument A. Moreover, if I dot getting the result of the function, we've actually parsed the code, and we know that it returns a number. So now you're getting, again, the number IntelliSense for the result of that function. right? So the rabbit hole gets deeper and deeper, and you can go do more and more complicated things and yet the IntelliSense can, can handle them. I'll show you one more example, which I think is kind of a crowning of this uh, accomplishment. So let's create another array. And arrays in JavaScript can take any arbitrary values. They don't have to be of the same type. So I'll throw in here a number, a string, and maybe an object that has another property, one that has a two. Right. So that's my array. And now let me enum enumerate over this array. And I'll give it a function callback that will take an item and the index. And then let me close these so I don't miss that. And in here, if we hit item number one, so in, oh, actually zero, ah, zero, I'll try to do something special. And of course, I mistyped something. There we go. So what happens if I type item dot right now? Well, it turns out. The first item is a number, so we get the number IntelliSense in this place because we're looking for index of 0, right? Another proof that we're actually running your code to determine what the type of that element is going to be at this point because statically it's impossible to know. The elements are of all kinds of different types. Just for, to prove that it's uh, really happening, if you do it now for element number 1, it's a string, so you get string IntelliSense in here, right? So magic happening behind the scenes, and we know what's going on. And then, you know, just to uh, round it up, if you do two, you get an object who has a prop that has a property one, and that property is a 
is a number, right? So all the way down, you get IntelliSense based on what we can figure out by running your code. Now, if you hear running code, you might be thinking, well, aren't there situations where you couldn't run our code because maybe I have an infinite loop somewhere? Or maybe I have a function that returns before it even gets to that line of code, right? And yeah, that's true. Those are problems. But we have ways to work around them. So we don't just blindly run your code as it is, but we try to catch those conditions. So we actually will um, alter your code before we run it. So we simulate portions of it. We will break out of infinite loops or loops that just might run too long. We eliminate return statements that might block us from reaching the line of code where, where you just hit the dot. Um, and just to give you an example of that, let's, let's take the same array. And uh, let's put an infinite loop in here. Right? And now hit A dot. And we're still running, right? And for each is available to you. So even though technically that code would never reach that line, we knew we were smart enough to, to cut out of that loop so we can give you IntelliSense. So again, a lot of smarts built into the engine to, to work with the dynamic nature of JavaScript to give you the, the right um, IntelliSense experience. OK. But for the most part, if, you, uh, if you're writing an actual app, you're not limited to just JavaScript. You're not, you don't live in this isolated box of JavaScript. You probably interact with the DOM. Um, and we have something for that as well. Let me erase this here. Um, and let's just try documents. So we know a thing or two about the documents. We know that it has add event handler. And it's a common thing you do. You will add some events. So let's try add event handler. And let's say load. And let's give it a function that takes the event. And then within that, if, did I miss something here? Oh, yes, I did. There you go. So now right, right here, let's see what properties that event has. And so even though this code doesn't actually run, right? There, no document was loaded in here. We are simulating execution so we can tell you what, uh, what properties this event is likely to have. Because we recognize it's a load event, and we know what it typically has. Um, this one is kind of vanilla. It doesn't have anything special. For instance, it doesn't have any properties called alt key. Um, but if I were to change this event to be a mouse move event, we're smart enough to recognize that it's going to give you a different type of event. And here, alt key is, for example, present. Right? So we have some built-in knowledge about the standard events in, from the DOM and standard elements in a DOM and try to give that, make that available to you so you don't have to grovel through some documentation to figure out what properties are available to you. Um, great. So that's one thing you do with the DOM. Another common pattern is to, um, to run element queries. You might want to get access to some of the elements of the DOM. And we support that, too. Um, so we'll get the uh, a div here, which will be extracted from document, get element by ID. You notice IntelliSense is helping me all along. And I'll just type in a magic string for a second, uh, host. And if I hit div dot, again, we recognize it's an HTML element, and it has a certain set of properties. Now, you might be wondering where this element came from, right? I'm just writing a bunch of JavaScript code. There is no DOM here. I'm not running any browser anywhere. So where is this coming from? Well, so we recognize that this is a common enough pattern that we should support it, and in fact, the IntelliSense engine grovels through the list of your uh, files in the project for all the, the HTML documents that refer to your currently edited uh, JavaScript file. So notice that I'm, I'm editing default.js. There's a default.html, which includes this JavaScript file. So what we do behind the scenes, for all the documents that match that pattern, we will instantiate that DOM or its representation um, in JavaScript, and we make it available to you. So we try to simulate the runtime experience as much as possible to be able to give you, you know, completion lists and, and things like that. Um, and just to uh, prove that it's actually live and working, this is the content host ID that I, that I just typed in over there. But uh, divs have just kind of a vanilla program, programming surface for any um, HTML element. Um, but I have a couple of others here. There's a canvas and there's an audio. And they're more interesting because they're, they have a unique programmatic API that I can interact with. So let's try to grab one of those and see how they look uh, in JavaScript. So let me do a canvas. And its ID was C. So let's pull that up. And now, if you're familiar with canvas, you'll know that it has that get context 
method, and there it is, right? So we recognize that it's a canvas element, not just a vanilla element, and we gave you that method. And in fact, it takes a string as a parameter, so I would do 2D and so forth, right? And similarly, if I wanted to look the, at the audio element, I can extract that as well. Its ID is A. And I would expect to be able to play that audio element, and indeed, play is one of the IntelliSense items in here, right? So we have very rich support for DOM, and we recognize the full set of W3C standards, uh, standard APIs that are available in a DOM, and we make them available to you um, in IntelliSense as well. So this is all well and good if you have that script embedded or referenced from your HTML statically, we can recognize that. But if you're write, writing an app that is large enough and has enough of a volume of JavaScript, you might actually be loading some of it dynamically. Or you might be using one of the you know, module loaders or, or script loader uh, libraries such as require.js that allows you to load scripts sort of dynamically and inject it into, um, into your document on the fly. And it turns out we can actually handle that pattern as well, even though it gets more and more complicated as we go. So, um, typically, you would use a library for this, like require.js, but I'm going to simulate what happens just by doing this by hand. So I have a piece of script here called script.js, which does a very com complicated thing, so, thing of creating a simple global variable. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice is starting to go a little bit at the end of the conference. And I would expect to, to have access to this global variable in my other script file. So let's just go over here. Oh, but just to be just to be sure that I'm not lying to you, notice that there's no, the script.js is not referenced from, from the HTML anywhere. So what I would typically do in order to inject it into the document, um, I will first create a script element. Dot body, actually document.create element first. <clears throat> this is basically what all the script loaders do under the covers, they create an element. And then they set the source of it. And in my case, this is slash.js slash script.js, script.js. And just to verify right now, there is no some global in scope, right? It's not showing up in my IntelliSense at all. Did I miss? Oh, yes, indeed. SJ is not the right extension. Well, let's try this again. And even still, some global should not be there because that script is not in the DOM anywhere, right? Right now I created an element and it's just kind of hanging out there. Uh, I have a reference to it. Great. So now I need to inject it into the document itself. So let's do document.body.appendChild and append that script. Now here's a moment I have to pause. We actually load that asynchronously behind the scenes and there's a bit of a delay. Um, but you'll, you'll see in a moment that some global should become available now. So now the script that creates the global variable got injected into the DOM. And because we execute that code, we know that it did. So let's see if this was enough time. Not yet. For some reason, this takes a little bit longer on my laptop than, uh, than I expected. But it does show up eventually. There it is. Ta-da! So some global now appeared, uh, even though that script was dynamically injected. And so that pattern works for, for all the uh, script loaders that you might use. Um, and basically, you know, that's kind of the bottom of this rabbit hole. Uh, we, you know, we've we execute your code, we execute the code that is, inject, or that is included in the, in the HTML directly and statically. We can also execute the code that is injected dynamically by other script loaders. And for all of this, we can give you IntelliSense. So this is really a, a very powerful experience for the modern style of JavaScript programming that supports the patterns and the libraries that are currently being used. So this is uh, about IntelliSense. I guess one other aspect that I wanted to cover is that we've expanded the, uh, the different documentation styles. Because again, in Visual Studio 2010, we supported VS Doc, which is the comments with XML annotations in them. And this was great for the Microsoft libraries, because we were all used to using that pattern. But it turns out many of the JavaScript libraries don't follow that convention, and some of them just use the whack whack comments to, to document their code. Others use JS Doc, um, and we didn't support that in Visual Studio 2010. In 2012, we have support built in for the uh, whack whack comments. And let me just show you how this works. Let me create a function, and I'll call it important, because it's a very important function. And then, you know, right now, if I don't have any, any annotations, um, the IntelliSense experience I get is the function is there, 
but there is no tooltip indicating what that function does, right? I can see the function, maybe the list of arguments, and that's already good, but it would have been better if I could find out what the function does directly there. So I can do this if I just inject a little comment in here. This is, oops, this is a very important, uh, I can't spell today. I really can't spell. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so if I'm lucky, now if I highlight this function, I get the tooltip right away that came from that comment. So we can match the comment with a, with a subsequent uh, piece of code and we, we give you those annotations. And this is nice for your own code, but the real purpose of it is to allow you to get richer information about libraries that tend to use this documentation style. And just to prove that point, um, I have a couple of them here. So popular backbone and underscore libraries, I don't need to open them actually, um, they both use that exact documentation style. There's no particular formatting to it, they're just whack whack comments, and you want to expose them to you as much as possible. So I'm doing a little trick here that, ah, <laughs> that I'll explain in just a second. So notice if I drag and drop them onto my JavaScript file, I get those um, comments that include a reference to those files. Um, because I'm not, I don't have references to, um, to those files in my HTML, I also didn't inject them into the DOM dynamically. This is a backdoor way to tell the IntelliSense engine that you want to have access to the IntelliSense for all the content of these files. So the IntelliSense engine will parse those particular comments and will get their content and, and suck it in and make it available to you. So now, underscore has this conveniently named underscore variable that if I dot into it, has an after method. And notice that there is, an, uh, there is a tooltip there with a description of what this method does. And now, if I hit F12 to see where this method is defined, you'll notice that it, in fact all it has is this, this little comment above it and we make it available to you in IntelliSense. So that greatly expands the amount of information that you have for many um, of the currently available libraries. And this is what we ship out of the box. What we don't have in the box is support for JS doc style documentation, but it turns out that's an easy way to uh, extend uh, the JavaScript and the, the IntelliSense engine to do that and I'll show it to you in just a moment. Okay. So right under here, under options, and if you dive into text editor, JavaScript, IntelliSense, and references, you'll see a list of files. And they're all JavaScript files. What the IntelliSense engine does is pulls in the content of these files and executing, executes their code effectively before any of your code runs. So any of the, and those are effectively the extensions into the, uh, into the editor that allow you to provide additional IntelliSense information or tweak some of the behaviors. Um, as one of the examples, um, if you look at this DOM Windows file right here, this is in fact where the definition of the DOM comes from. This is the editor's view of what the DOM looks like. And in our version of it, we include all of the W3C standards as well as some of the non-standard things that IE has, like document.all because people have come to rely on that, but it's not actually part of the standard. We've had feedback from some customers that they didn't want to see any of the non-standard extensions because they want to be writing only fully standard code that will be portable between browsers. And so, turns out that's an easy, easy fix by just going into this, this file and tweaking it a little bit. Um, the, all these files come from this one specific directory under Visual Studio, JavaScript references, and so forth. And so let me uh, grab one of them. Uh, to save you the typing, I actually have that open, and we'll open that file right here. I'm just pasting that same um, directory, and let's open the DOM windows. So this is a long file that contains the full definition of the DOM as seen from JavaScript. We won't try to read it all, but we'll try to find the document.all. There it is. So let me just comment it out. and see if it actually, ah, one thing I forgot to show you is the document that document.all was showing up before. Let me, double, let me go back a little, um, clear this. Document.all is here, right? If you didn't like it, you might want to remove it. So let's now go back to the DOM Windows file and comment it out. And you will see that if I attempt this again, 
document.all is gone, right? It's not there. So this shows you that, in fact, some of the knowledge that the IntelliSense engine has comes from these extensions. And by tweaking them, you can customize what you see um, in your completion list and so forth. And that's just one example. Uh, let me give you another one. One of the common conventions in JavaScript, because JavaScript does not have any encapsulation mechanism, doesn't have any way of syntactically expressing that you want a, a particular property to be private, um, many of the libraries employ certain conventions. They typically will prefix the name with an underscore, or maybe a dollar sign, or maybe add a suffix of some sort. And so in your IntelliSense, you might want to hide those private members. And it turns out that can be done as well. Um, and we do it by default, but via an extension. So let's uh, examine what this looks like. Uh, let's do a, make a function here. Person, uh, that'll take a name. And all it'll do, is we'll just assign that name to a, a property of their object. Right now, this is completely public, so um, if I new up a person, John, maybe, and then say p dot, I see the name, right? Now, if I prefix this with an underscore, I might want it to be hidden, and in fact, we do this out of the box. Now, granted, this is not really making it impossible to access that property, right? Because the property is still public, there's no private properties in JavaScript. But it is hidden from your IntelliSense to indicate to you that, well, maybe the author of that library didn't intend for you to use that particular property, right? And the way we do this is through another extension. I keep doing the same thing. Um, if you look in the same tools and options, the same reference list here, there is an underscore filter. And that little piece of JavaScript, which we will open in a second, um, does the filtering of the list to eliminate the properties that are prefixed with an underscore. So now suppose that your organization or library that you happen to use uses a different convention and uses a dollar instead. By default, that dollar name is showing up here. If you wanted to hide it, you could go into this filter file or create your own. That's not where we are. Let's uh, copy it from here again. There's this underscore, underscore filter. And I won't get into the great level of detail here, but the IntelliSense engine exposes uh, a property of the global object called IntelliSense that you can attach events to. Um, and those events are fired at, at key times of the IntelliSense uh, processing. In this case, the uh, statement completion event fires whenever you hit some object dot. And this handler in particular looks through the list of items that, that will be populated into that uh, dropdown and filters out all of those that have a name and whose name starts with an underscore. So if I wanted to extend it to also hide those that start with a dollar, all I'd have to do is do an or dot name car at zero equals 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 dollar. And if I save this file and try this again, notice that the dollar name is gone, right? So all that functionality came from this one extension, a simple extension, and you can imagine handling your particular customizations of the IntelliSense engine in that way if we don't do them out of the box. And sort of the most glorified, ex glorified extension that we have created, although it doesn't ship with Visual Studio, it was built by one of the interns um, on my team, is for handling the JS doc comments. I mentioned it doesn't ship out of the box, but uh, this would probably become available as an extension. So JS doc comments look something like this. Well, not like this, more like this. <laughs> They are just block comments with an extra asterisk. And the first thing you write is a description of the function. So let's say creates a new person. And then you can, you can specify parameters with this kind of funky notation, param, then the type of the param that you expect, the name of it, and then a description. So the name of the person. And then you can annotate it additionally with some other things. So you can, you can say that you intended this person function to be, to be treated like a class, because in your object-oriented programming model, you want to treat it as a class. So right now, you can see that if I do, uh, let's uh, get into the person right here. Person, it's treated as a function, and I just get that, that full comment in there, which isn't all that helpful. 
Um, but if I was able to parse the content of the JS doc documentation, I can give you a better experience. So what I'll pull in here is this extra extension that we have written. And I have it scrolled away here as well. So let me copy this path. It's just a file that I have on my hard drive somewhere. And I can pull it in. Parse JS doc comments. And it should show up here at the bottom of the list. There it is. So now when I click OK, this file is now included in a list of things that will be executed by the editor before running any of your code. Now let's start person again. So now one thing you might notice that person actually has a different icon. That icon came from this little class annotation. And it indicates that this is a class, or at least should be thought of as class. So that's number one, not performance. Person. Let's try this again. OK. Um, and also, if you notice, there, the creates a new person is extracted out of the big comment as the description of the function. But there's more. If I now open the, the parentheses, I can see that, this, that the function expects a parameter name of type string. And in fact, that name will become the name of the person. So the extension parsed out the entire format of the comment and made it available to me in a rich way through the IntelliSets. So extensions can go as far as that. All that came from that little piece of JavaScript. Well, maybe it's not that little. But it's, it's a JavaScript extension, not the core editor here. So there's a lot of extensibility that you can take advantage of if you need to uh, customize your experience. So that concludes the first portion of the demo. This was all about the editor and all about the IntelliSense. Um, the key takeaway is there's nothing that you have to learn here or memorize. For the most part, everything just works out of the box. No matter what libraries you're using, no matter what style of code you write, because we can run that code, we can give you accurate information just, just like that. So you, you should basically expect your JavaScript editing experience to be on par with what you get with C Sharp or VB. There will be some limitations at the corners, but generally speaking, we're very much on par right now. Now, when you write an application, writing it is only one part. Typically, you've written the code, but you're not done yet. Now when you run it, you find out that things aren't really working the way you expect, right? Traditionally, debugging JavaScript applications has been a big pain in the neck, and you'd probably be hard pressed to find somebody who would say something like this. Particularly, tracing through CSS rules and figuring out which one applies to your particular element and why does it look different than it, that you expected it to has been difficult. Now, in the browsers, uh, either in, in IE through the F12 console or maybe in, in Firefox, the Firebug, you may know some of the tools that help you deal with those things. And in fact, the JavaScript community has amassed a certain sort of iterative workflow of trying to fix problems or, or tweak and improve their applications without necessarily going to the source code and changing things. It's kind of a try and check approach and maybe try again and check something else or try something else, and eventually you arrive at the right solution. We didn't have that um, approach in Visual Studio, uh, and we didn't want you to have to create your, or write your code in Visual Studio and then go to another set of tools to deal with debugging. And so in, in Visual Studio 2012, we've improved that experience dramatically. There are two big areas. One is um, in terms of um, code stepping. When you arrive at a breakpoint, we want to give you as much information about the state of your app as possible. So one of the new things that we've added is you have the full information about what the this pointer is bound to. You get information about the globals, about all the variables that are currently in scope. None of that was available before, actually, if you can believe it. Um, you can get the prototype chain of, a, of any given object. Again, new thing, very important in JavaScript. Um, and we've also cleaned things up a little bit so that so we hide all the method on, methods of an object under you know, a common umbrella because for the most part you care about the state, the, the values of variables, not, not of methods. And the other area is we've given you a bevy of new uh, uh, debugging windows to handle the DOM. There's basically a live DOM now fully connected between the browser and, uh, and Visual Studio. I'll show you how this works. And a number of uh, CSS tools to help you track down what exactly applies to any given element. And then finally, there's a JavaScript console, which allows you to programmatically interact with, the, with your application. You can, you can read the state of it, but you can also modify it, and it will be reflected live in your app. So the, the point here is you get this quicker turnaround cycle. You don't have to stop the app, go to the source code, tweak something, run it again, and see if it worked. You just work with the live app all, all along. 
And I'll show you a demo of that as well. So let's switch to um, another Visual Studio instance. And by the way, one thing I forgot to mention is that all of these uh, tooling experiences you get work just as well with uh, web applications in the browser as they do with the Metro applications in Windows 8. The same, um, same, you get basically the same experience. So before I was using the Windows 8 template, now we will switch to a web app, and the project I'm using here is a to-do MVC, which you may have heard of. Um, it's a little community project which aims to implement the same little to-do application in all possible application, JavaScript application frameworks, of which there are just gobs and gobs, and the, the spectrum is, seems to be getting broader every day. Um, so let me just run this app first. Let's start with that. I'll close this. We don't need it right now. And run the app just hitting F5. That'll start the browser, and I'll arrange them side by side so you can see what's going on. Really simple app. Um, I get to type in some to-dos, and they'll appear in my list, as you would expect. So uh, let's say prepare for the stock. Great. Uh, finish the talk to great applause. What that? Uh, maybe, I don't know, set the alarm for 3.30 AM and catch a flight uh, it's at 7.10. Great. OK, so as you expect, things get ad added to the list. I can also check them off the list. Great, I've prepared, hopefully. Um, I'm done with that one. Um, and you know, I can clear those that are completed off the list as well. And I can also edit, um, change things in there. So maybe that was a bit too early, so let's make it 4.30. I should still be able to make, to the, make it to the 7.30 flight. Um, how interesting here. Looks like something I was trying to show you uh, is not working. There was actually a bug in here which, if I tabbed out, would not uh, remove the edit box. So let me try to quickly recover and put the bug back in, and you pretend that you didn't see it. Uh, where were we? We were in here. And I'll find the close function. Excellent. This was not supposed to be there. OK, so you didn't see it. I didn't do it. Let's try again. OK, so now if I edit this and tab out, I would expect to see what, what happened a moment ago. But in fact, there's a bug here that will not remove this edit box. So let's start debugging and try to figure out exactly what was wrong. So the first thing I might do, I have a vague idea that typically when an element loses focus, it fires a blur event. So let me go to the source code and try to search for that blur event and see what, uh, what happens there. OK. Don't mind this too much. This is just the backbone. Um, by the way, this is the backbone version of the to-do app. That's just the backbone's way of wiring events. So what this says over here is that whenever a blur event fires on an element that is of class to-do input, then um, use the close handler to handle that event. So next thing I'll do is I'll go to the close uh, function, and there it is. Great, looks like it's saving some information. That looks legitimate. Um, let's just put a breakpoint in here and see what happens if I do it again. So let me go back to the, to the app, hit tab, and here I am at my breakpoint. And let's see what the, what the state of the app is. So the first thing I'll do is I'll open the locals window just to show you that we now have better information there than we did before. So you can see I have the globals. And here, jQuery appears under two different guises, because that's what jQuery does. There's the underscore variable from the underscore library, backbone, and a few others. Um, the scope, that's all that's currently in the local scope of my function. And there's some stuff here created by the to-do app. We will not delve into this. What I am interested in is that this pointer right here, because I suspect that this is somehow attached to the element in the DOM that, that is not being handled correctly. So let's expand that. And I see this thing that, look, that, that looks like an element. It's an EL. Let's just be sure that it is, in fact, an element. I'll try to expand this, ah, if I can touch it correctly. There you go. It's an HTML LI element, so list item element. Looks like the thing that, I, that I'm really after. Um, but if I expand it, there's a lot of stuff on it. I could be groveling through that list, but that may be too long. It might actually be more convenient for me to open the JavaScript console. So again, debug windows, JavaScript console. 
and let's see what I can learn about this element. So this dot el, ah, and the, uh, the console recognizes that it's an element and it gives me a DOM visualization or HTML visualization of that element. So I can see it's a list item with some divs inside and whatnot. But what's interesting is that it has this class called editing. And that sounds fishy because I'm done editing, so I would expect it to, to not have that element. I mean, that class, in fact. So let's see if I can remove it programmatically and fix the issue. So let's do a little bit of a jQuery here. This.el dot remove class, and the class is called editing. So I remove that. I'm still stuck at a breakpoint. Let me remove that breakpoint and ran the app. And voila, that took care of it, right? The, the text box disappeared. My item looks, looks as I expected it to look. So now that I know what the fix is, I can go back to the source code and actually apply it. So let me do that quickly. Um, it looks like basically what I need to do is remove that class, right? So if I go back to the code, in fact, if I looked around, I would notice that, that the function above adds that class. I'll just cut and paste this and change it to remove the class. Save that. Refresh here. And let's double check that it works now. Great. So after I figure it out sort of iteratively by trying and checking my solution that it works, then I can go back and, and actually apply it. Great. So this is all well and good. But what if I want to learn a little bit more about my, my application's DOM um, overall? And we have this DOM, ex DOM Explorer window, also available through Debug and Windows, that actually shows you live DOM as it is displayed in the browser. So this is the rendering of the DOM that the browser parsed out of your HTML, and it is connected live to your browser. So if I move over the items in it, you can see that they get selected in the browser. And let me open up the to-do app, maybe, and the content. And here's the create to do. Great. So what happens if I start typing here? Add another item to the list. Do you see what's happening in the Visual Studio on the left? The DOM Explorer is, is automatically updated, live connected to that live DOM in the browser. And I see all the edits. So in fact, I saw the, cha the text changing and I was as I was typing. And then when this little tooltip appeared, I also saw the, the style of it change, or display attribute of it change, right? Um, moreover, if I expanded the to-dos down here, I will see there's a to-do list, and it has one, two, three, four items, and as I mouse over and they get highlighted. So now, to the list, if I type, if I hit enter, you'll notice that one more item got added to the list. That one right here. Right, and I can expand it, and it's all there, and shows the text that I just edited. So you can see there is a connection between the browser and, uh, and Visual Studio on the left. And in fact, there is a connection that goes the other way as well. So if I click this uh, Select Element button, it allows me to mouse over the DOM elements in the browser. And if I click them, they will get selected right here in the DOM Explorer. And I can edit them. So I'll do To Do App instead. And if I hit Enter, that gets automatically updated again in the browser. So you can very easily manipulate the DOM live, and it will be reflected automatically on the other side. Don't have to go and change the HTML and restart the app and, and do things like that. Excellent. So DOM is good. Um, but oftentimes, the, the most painful part is dealing with CSS styles. And we try to help you here as well. So one of the things that I don't really like about this app right now is that when I check the checkbox, the, turn, the, the text turns red. That seems backwards. I would like to maybe gray it out or cross it out or something like that. So let me try to track down where that comes from. So first of all, I'll select that element right here. And it gets selected over in the DOM Explorer at the bottom. And now I'll go to the Styles window. And notice that we have two of them. There's a Styles and a Trace Styles. The difference is that the Styles window shows you all the rules, all the CSS rules that apply to current element. And the Trace Styles shows you all of the attributes that that element received as a result of applying all, the, all of those rules. So what I want to do is I want to track down the rule that, that turned this item red. And you will see that we have some inherited rules that apply to a bunch of elements. Those are probably not the ones I want. There's another one that applies to a whole bunch of elements, probably not mine as well. But here's one that looks interesting. It has some red in it. And it also applies to a to-do a to content class that is a child of an element that is a done class, and then a child of an element that is a to-do list. That looks interesting. 
Let me see if I can uncheck this box. Ah, there it is. So if I uncheck the box, I can see that the color went away. So that's, that must be the one that I need. So now let's check it back on, and maybe I can change it to a nice shade of gray. Let's say pound 777. Voila, it's grayed out. And I can even add another property to this rule, and I'll say text decoration line through. And there you go, it gets crossed out and grayed out. So again, I could do it all within the IDE. I didn't have to change my source code. Now that I know what I want, I can go back and change my CSS rules to reflect that. Excellent. There's one more thing that I don't like very much, and that's that those little checkboxes got kind of indented with respect to this checkbox. I'd like them to kind of be flushed all to the left. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'll, I'll take a look at uh, this guy here. Again, I do use the select element. And this time, the first thing I'll do is I'll look at the layout. This gives me the full picture of the box model of this current element. So starting from the middle, let me make it a little bigger if I can. Ah, the mouse is not cooperating, cooperating with me today. So it's a 19 by 19 in the middle, has some padding around it, has no border, has some margin though. There is a seven pixel margin on the left and 10 pixel on the right. That may be something that I, that I should check. And then the offset just indicates where it is with respect to the uh, beginning of the document. Uh, so let's compare this to what the, the one that I want it to look like looks like. Great. This one has zero margin on either side. So maybe that's what I'm after. Maybe I want to change the margin, and in particular, probably the one on the left. So let me select the one that I'm after again. And this time I'll go to the trace styles. And I'll find the margin left right here. If I expand it and uncheck it, ah, there you go. They all got flushed to the left. So again, a slightly different tool that allows me to approach the problem from a different angle, depending on what I happen to know or depending on what, what uh, problem I'm facing, I can use a different tool to help me out. And again, once I know what the solution is, I can actually go and apply it. So now we, you, we've seen the DOM, the DOM Explorer, and the CSS tools, but sometimes the, the most expedient thing to do is to drop down to the JavaScript console and just hack away at your app and make changes that way. So let's try this approach. Um, and again, I think, oh, there it is. They didn't close it. There you go. Make it a little bigger. We'll clear it. OK. So before we saw how the JavaScript console works at a breakpoint, but you can actually interact with the app at a, at a global level. So I can just go ahead and type in document, and I can get its properties. I can say document.body. We've seen already that we give you a visualization of, uh, of the HTML that is contained within it. If that's not what I want, if I want to see the uh, JavaScript properties, you can right click and do evaluate as object, and you get the JavaScript view of all the properties. You can achieve the same thing by typing a magic function called dir for directory, I think. Um, and let's do document.body. And you also get the JavaScript view of all the properties in it. Sometimes that's just a more convenient approach. Um, OK. So I can do that. Let me see if I can add something to the document. Well, actually, let me try something else first. Um, the interesting thing about this app is that it stores its state in a persistent store using the local storage uh, API from, that, that came with HTML5. Um, this allows the app to preserve the list. If I restart it later, I didn't lose all of my um, items in my, in my to-do list. So let's look at that local storage. Uh, let me clear the list. There it is. And if I expand it, I see there is a property called to-do's backbone. And it has a long string that looks like it's formatted in JSON. So let me pull it out. Move the mouse out of the way. Um, and let's do local storage to-do's backbone. But because it's in JSON, let me parse it. So I'll say json.parse. OK, and then if I look at to-dos, I can see the object. And it's one, two, three, four, five entries. Each of them appears to be one of those items in the list, right? Um, so let's track down the one that I just added, the add another item. It's always the last one. You never know. There it is. OK. And let's say that I wanted to test my app and see if it behaves correctly 
if I remove something from the, the local storage without using the UI. So I want to do some backdoor testing. Um, and so let me grab the ID of this element. And I'll just delete it from the to-dos. Like so. And then just to double check, to-dos, if I list them now, should only have four properties. And so it does, one, two, three, four. Great. So let me stick those to-dos back into the local storage under the same name. Great. Uh, and this time I'll have to stringify it back into JSON. To-dos. Great. There's my string again under local storage. Just to double check, storage should have the to-dos backbone, and it does, and there's a text. So I'd expect if I now refresh the app for this one last item to be gone if my app is behaving correctly. And indeed, that's exactly what happened. And by the way, since you remember I didn't make the changes in my CSS styles, the, the, the old styles still apply here, right? Because I didn't change the source code there. Um, so that's a, you know, another way to use the, the console to interact with my app live and, and test it in a certain way. So the one last thing I wanted to show you is that there is a nice integration between those different windows within, within Visual Studio. So um, let's first create a new object, a new element directly from the console. I'll create a new div, uh, document.createElement div. OK. Uh, then I'll give this div some content, text content uh, equals dynamically added from the console. OK. And then let me inject it into the document. So document.bodychild div. And voila, there it is in my browser. It appeared directly there. Um, what's even better is I can see it. I can directly uh, wire it up to my DOM Explorer. I can do it directly from my console window. So select is another one of those magic functions that we have that allows you to do some extra meta tooling here. Um, select div. And notice that it popped up right here in my DOM Explorer. Make it a little bigger. So how about I add an ID to this, to this element? So I'm adding an attribute in the attributes window. It's an ID. And I'll call it my div. Notice that it uh, got updated here. And now let me try to add a, a style to it. Let me roll those up, inherited once again a little bit. One, two. And if I right click here and add a new rule, notice that the window is smart enough to know that I probably want to apply it to the currently selected element. And its class is my div, so it gives me that uh, rule selector. And let's say I want to align it in the center, text align center. And there it is. So you can see that I can hook up from, from the console to the DOM Explorer to the CSS window. They all work together. And whatever style is most appropriate for a given solution that I'm looking for, I can use it. Um, and last, last thing to show you is that, in fact, the currently selected element is also available to me in the J JS console by just using $0 variable. So see, that's the div that I just added. And I can interact with it. I can say text content. Uh, equals just changed from the console again. And again, there it is in updates live. So all these tools work together to give you just the most expedient way of addressing the problems that you see in your app. And that's the last of the demo. I'll switch back to the slides. And in fact, all I have left is to summarize what we've uh, talked about. So uh, hopefully you're coming away from, from this talk with conviction that JavaScript has been now elevated to a first-class status in Visual Studio, that we've given you enough tools in the editor itself that you don't really have to learn about that just kind of work with you, with your code, with the, the library's code that you might be using, all based on the execution underneath. Um, and that's, that's where the intellisense comes, intellisense comes from. And then we gave you a set of tools for the iterative um, application debugging and, and uh, you know, the, the kind of try and test approaches that are common on the web that oftentimes help you deal with you know, HTML or CSS. And to do that, you don't have to leave the IDE. You don't have to change your source code. You can do it live on the live instance of your app as it runs. 
And again, it applies both to Windows 8 apps based on JavaScript as well as your web apps running in, in IE. Um, and that's really all I had for now. Uh, <laughs> this is the, if you have any questions, there, we have about 15 minutes left. But for those of you who want to leave, I'll, I'll leave that slide up here as well. Uh, there are some resources that are still available. I'm sure you've seen that slide before. And if you still have time later on to fill the evaluations, that would be great. Uh, we do take them seriously. And now with that, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. And for those who want to leave, uh, feel free to do so. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for attending TechEd, and uh, have a safe trip home. Um, and questions, I'll, I'll take them now. Thank you. Yes. Yep. Uh, arrays of HTML file? Yes. So the question was, does the uh, IntelliSense that we provide based on the HTML files referring to JavaScript files, is it, does it only work for static HTML? Yes. So the, the answer is yes. We only parse the static part. But as, as you can see, if you dynamically inject the script or inject some part of uh, HTML that includes some script, we will handle that as well. But again, you will have to actually run that code that, you know, or, or type in the code, have it somewhere that injects that script. If, if for some reason your scenario doesn't fit that model, there's always this backdoor pass of you know, dragging the, the requisite files onto your JS, and it will create this reference uh, comment that we will also handle. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, no, I don't believe we do. So the question was, do we have uh, regions uh, that you can use, establish with comments? No, I don't think we do. Maybe next time. <laughs> next question. Are you asking if, if start writing in JavaScript or start writing in a different language and translate it to JavaScript? Is that a question? Because just to repeat, so would you recommend uh, that, that I write my app starting in JavaScript or use some other language and get it cross-compiled to, to JavaScript? Well, the cross-compilers have their limitations, uh, the, the, but JavaScript does, one, does have one too. And currently, for really large-scale projects, JavaScript is a little difficult to manage. There is relatively little in a way of modular approach or of kind of encapsulation. Um, there are improvements coming in ECMAScript 6. In all likelihood, we'll get module loaders. We might get some uh, class-like patterns and so forth. So, but for, a, for anything that is you know, a scale of a few developers, you can certainly start with JavaScript and be fine. Um, there are also attempts at creating sort of higher level languages that, that sit above JavaScript but compile faithfully to JavaScript. That may be a good approach in the future as well. They're sort of in their fledgling states, and it's not clear where they're going to go yet. So if I were to say today, for an app that is relatively small, certainly JavaScript is a fine place to start. Other questions? Uh, I think you're waiting for a moment. Go ahead. Thank you. Ah, so the question is, um, does the live link between the browser and, um, and uh, Visual Studio work only in Internet Explorer, or does it work with other browsers? Um, it only works with IE. Um, there are no current plans to make it work with other browsers. The hope would be that because IE is now very much standards-based, um, that the code will just work in other browsers as well. If, for whatever reason, it happens to work in IE just fine, but not in other browsers, you'll, probably, you'll have to rely on the built-in tools that those browsers provide. And generally speaking, Chrome and Firefox have pretty good tooling, uh, so the major three you would have covered. Um, but generally speaking, my expectation would be that code that runs in IE, um, IE 9 or 10, would work just fine in other browsers as well. Yes, uh, hold on. There was a question here, I think, that came first. Yeah, let me. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so as I understand the question is, the question is if I define a, a property first and then later on in my code I change its value to something that is of a different type, would it be reflected correctly in IntelliSense? Is that correct? Is that my correct question? Or? Mm -hmm. So, if at any point you, you hit whatever object dot, um, and then, or the property dot, you'll get the correct intelligence for that point in, in your code. So, if you follow the code path um, that actually changed that value to, to be a different type, you will get correct intelligence for the different type. Um, so, in that sense, it will give you the warning. Um, it gets a little hairy because it all depends on which code path you, know, you, you end up taking. And because in some cases we have to simulate because some code paths will take you off to the side where you won't even hit that point in code, uh, there will be places where it might be inaccurate. But generally speaking, most of the code that JavaScript developers write, that I see anyway, tends to be fairly consistent in terms of uh, property you know, types, even though it's not required, but very often it actually is uh, fairly consistent. So we do our best given the, the dynamic nature of JavaScript. There will be some situations where you know, it may not be accurate 100% because yeah, it changes from one place to another. Go ahead. Uh, no, it will not give you a list of, of uh, uh, element IDs, no. That's interesting. Yeah, that, that would be an interesting feature. We would have to figure out how to expose it because it's not traditional, it's not a property of anything. Um, so it would have to be some maybe additional magic key. Yeah. Yeah, by the way, just to repeat the question, the question was whether, um, whether I can get a list of um, all the IDs of the elements in the DOM, for example, or all the classes in my CSS styles. Um, and the answer is currently we don't have it. Um, that would be an interesting idea. Um, so if you, if you want to follow up on that, by all means, shoot me an email, and I'd love to uh, connect with the right people who could make it happen. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, no. So if you, once you've changed it in the live CSS, that's by, it's memory representation, you have to go back to your source code or, or CSS styles and change them by hand. Um, I would expect this to be a requested feature, so maybe in the next release we'll uh, supply that as well. Other questions? Uh, when were there? Sorry. <laughs> ah, the question is, can I write, write and, and test uh, uh, JavaScript through unit test framework? It's a good question. I actually don't know for sure. So I'll, if you can send me a mail, I'll try to answer that question with some authority at the time. <laughs> right now, I don't know. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Ah, excellent question. Yes. So in the example that I was showing with the array, when the array had multiple uh, different elements of different types, I was checking specifically my, my if statement so, so as to indicate which item I'm interested in. What if I didn't do it? Um, well, the, the answer is we take the default of the first argument of the uh, element of the array and we'll show you that. So we're trying to do what we can because otherwise we would show you nothing. So we, we, we take the first element and hope the array is consistently typed. If it's not, well then you know, you'll get what, what you get for the first element. Any other questions? Yeah. One over there. Ah, excellent question. Will the integration with, I, with Internet Explorer work with IE9? You know, I should know it, but I don't. Uh, <laughs> I think it does, and I'm not sure if there are limitations to it. So again, I'll have to defer to, uh, to an email, and I'll try to answer that question uh, better then. One more. Yes. Uh, I believe it will. So that, that it's a little tricky because you cannot use those those, those strings as um, you know in a dotted notation because they're not valid uh, identifiers. So uh, yeah, it will. So basically, we will we will list all the all the properties available on the on the object. Um, if you attended my, 
I'm not sure if I repeated the questions, just to be sure that I do. The question was, if, if my property name contains spaces and therefore requires the, uh, the bracket notation, would it show up in my IntelliSense list? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, but it's a little tricky because you can't really use it in a dot notation. And I'm not sure if we're intelligent enough to show you only the ones that you can use in a dotted notation versus all the ones that are, what's that? No, it definitely will not, it, we will not change your code. Uh, IntelliSense just hints. But I'm not positive we're smart enough to, to filter the list down to what is actually um, usable in a dotted notation versus the, the square bracket notation. Uh, we probably have time for two more questions if there are any more. So uh, one more over there. Ah, interesting. Uh, this may already work out of the box. Um, not positive. Uh, if you remind me by email, I'll definitely follow up. And if it's not there, I'll put it on a wish list for the next release. Thank you. Uh, one more question, and I think we'll be done. Why don't you just use the JavaScript-style comments? Oh, yeah, we do. So this is, this is the VS doc notation. Sorry, the question was, why don't we use the comments with the three slashes, like in C Sharp? And the answer is we actually make them available. These were the ones that were available all the time, like in, in Visual Studio 2010 as well. Um, this is the VS doc, uh, documentation style with XML annotations for parameters and so forth. So that works and worked before what I was describing here were just additions in Visual Studio 2012. OK, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much for attending. If you, did, if you have any other questions that you didn't get answered, my email is there. Feel free to email me. I'd love to um, help and respond in any way I can. Thanks again for attending, and have a safe trip home.